Won't anyone see us? No, not they. Oh, we're a fair way from the shore, right enough. Oh, I thought the mist would be cold, but it isn't at all. <laughs> well, you're with me, aren't you? Mm. And I'm entirely the warm one. Oh. Huh. I don't ever want to have to go back. Oh, good. I was beginning to think you were getting bored with my company. Oh, you. I wish this could be forever. It will, my love. It will be. The Cardboard Box by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Roger Danes. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Kevin Waitley as Jim Browner and Stephen Thorne as Inspector Lestrade. The Cardboard Box. There you go, Bob. That might put you right, then. I'll say. <laughs> There's nothing like lemonade to clear a first on a hot day. Nothing like your lemonade, anyhow. <laughs> nice and cool inside the house. Oh, come on. Not really, Annabelle. Got another score of parcels to do. Oh, we shouldn't have come to us first, then. You're always first on my list, Annabelle. Oh, go on. It's the lemonade brings you. I know. It's not. You could step in a moment. Get cool. Well, won't she have something to say about that? Her upstairs. Miss Cushing? Oh, she's a lamb. Besides, she won't know, will she? Oh, no burst. It, it, it's not I'm not tempted, Annabelle. And if you wasn't the first on me round, I'd surely step inside it. <gasps> By crikey! It's Miss Cushing! Somebody's a murdering her! <sighs> You're right, Watson. It does seem a most preposterous way of settling a dispute. Utterly preposterous. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dear fellow, your face. Well, how should I look, Holmes, when you have just echoed the very thought of my soul and without my ever having expressed it? Hmm. I should have spared you had it not been for a certain incredulity on your part the other day. What? Mr. Edgar Allan Poe's mere tour de force. Oh, that. Hmm? So you not dismiss Monsieur Auguste Dupin's train of reasoning as unworthy of belief? But the murders in the Rue Morgue is a fantasy, Holmes. Yeah, but I reminded you that I, too, have such a faculty, even that I am constantly in the habit of reasoning the unspoken thoughts of my companions, you express the same incredulity. I have no remembrance of doubting you ever. Well, perhaps not with your tongue, but your eyebrows are most expressive. If I remember aright, though, Poe's Dupin character drew his conclusions from his friend's actions. An unvoiced word, a stumble over a heap of stones, looking up at the stars in a familiar street, and so on. And so? Well, I have been quietly sitting in my chair. Ah, but your features, my dear fellow, your features have expressed your every emotion. And from them, you have read my train of thoughts. Perhaps you cannot yourself recall how your brown study commenced. Well, of course not. Well, then I'll tell you. You threw down your newspaper. There was nothing in it. Well, please, did Watson, after a minute or so, <coughs> during which your expression was utterly vacant, oh. you fixed your attention upon General Gordon over there. I hazard that you were admiring the new frame to his portrait. Go on. And then your eyes flashed across to the unframed portrait of Henry Ward Beecher. Frames were uppermost in your mind, obviously. But then you glanced up at the wall, and I deduced you to be thinking Beecher would just nicely cover the bare space to make a match with Gordon. You have followed me exactly. Well, I could hardly have gone astray so far. <clears throat> your thoughts went back to Beecher. Well, naturally, given your family connection, your eyes first narrowed as you considered the character of his features and then relaxed. You were recalling the incidents of his career. I had no idea you... Yeah, your natural strength of feeling, as I know full well, would lead you next to thoughts of the American Civil War via Beecher's efforts to promote the Northern Union cause. And you confirmed my suspicion. Your lips tightened, your eyes 
sparkled and your hands clenched. You were clearly dwelling upon the gallantry shown by both sides in that desperate struggle. Yes, indeed. Your face grew sadder. Huh? You shook your head. The horror. The useless waste of life. Precisely. And then your hand stole towards your left shoulder. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. A slight smile appeared on your lips. Then, much as it does now, you were thinking of your own war injuries and the ridiculous aspect of such a method of settling international differences. Well, is it not preposterous? And at that point, I agreed with you. Oh, you have explained it all, Holmes. And I confess I am as amazed as before. Well, it's gratifying to find my deductions have been correct. <laughs> uh, it's merely a diversion, Watson, in the absence of some new, better puzzle. Inspector Lestrade! All right, driver. Uh, Mr Lestrade, the standard. Inspector! Uh, you got here quick, gentlemen. Anything to say to the Daily Chronicle, Inspector? Yes, go away. Do you have any details of the case so far? Any clues, sir? Uh, what about the lady in the business, Inspector? Yeah, how did she react to such a gruesome discovery? If I should find time to give you an opinion, gentlemen, it will be later. Uh, do you intend to question the lady now, sir? That is the normal procedure in such matters, yes. Would you say the lady in the case we was a colourful sort? Oh, has a past, does she, sir? The police have no reason to suppose Miss Cushing may be anything other than highly respectable. Ah. Uh, how old is she, Inspector? Do you mind? Have you spoken to the delivery boy who brought the packet? In good time. I have. What did he say, then? He said... Good afternoon, gentlemen. He said very little. But what he did say, you can all read in my column tomorrow, can't you? <laughs> Uh, just the three. Oh, uh, well. One for me from South Sea. Yes, Mrs. Watson enjoying her holiday. Yes, very much. Yes, she wishes I were there. Ah, yes, the impecunious husband. Mm. Sell some more stories, Watson, and then you both may afford to sun yourselves by the seaside. Another one from Mr. Montague Clinch. Oh, that man. Burn it, Watson, at once. He's never ceased to pester me since that damnable affair with the beauty of Bath. <laughs> and lastly... This from Inspector Lestrade. Ah. I have a case here in Croydon I think is very much in your line. We have every hope of clearing the matter up, but we find a little difficulty in getting anything to work upon. Oh, difficulty? I know that code. He writes we may find a report on the matter in the Daily Chronicle. The Chronicle? Good God! Is this the kind of depth to which we've sunk, Watson? Do we have that rag still about the place? Uh, I, um, I, I clean my No, no matter. Feet. We'll read it on the train. Hmm? What do you say, Watson? Can you rise superior to this heat? Uh, there's no hardship after India, Holmes. And I was longing for something to do. Hmm, there's always the off chance of a case for your annals. Perhaps even some money for your postponed holiday. Uh, I have considered that. Well, then, my dear fellow, you shall have it. <laughs> there, uh, beneath the financial news. Ah, yes. A gruesome discovery. Not gruesome enough to merit a position above the money. No, Miss Susan Cushing, living across Street, Croydon, has been the victim of a particularly revolting practical joke. At two o'clock yesterday afternoon, a small brown paper-wrapped packet dispatched from Belfast was handed in by the postman. To the horror of the 50-year-old maiden lady and that of her pretty young servant, Annabelle... No, the facts, Watson, if you please, not the hearts and flowers. The cardboard package contained two freshly severed human ears. I've told you, I know nothing whatever about those dreadful things, Mr Lestrade. I really cannot see the use of asking me yet more questions. It is the normal Miss Cushing's quite right. The most fruitful start to our inquiries is likely to be the evidence of the package itself and, of course, its contents. Oh, they are in the outhouse. I won't have them in here, Mr Lestrade. I only wish you would take them away altogether. In good time, Miss Cushing. First of all, though, I would be obliged if you will inform my friends about your three medical student lodgers. Is this your hope for clearing the matter up, Lestrade? They are the only men the police can think of, gentlemen, who could have been capable of so malicious a practical joke. You don't believe in it yourself, then? Well, I have to admit to its plausibility, These but... medical fellows will get up to any tricks, believe you me. You must once have been a student yourself, Doctor. I never sent severed ears by parcel post, Lestrade. <laughs> Uh, please tell us about Mr McIlroy's dinner, then, Miss Cushing. 
This would have been about a couple of years ago, gentlemen, at my former house in Penge. And some weeks before I was obliged to ask my three lodgers to leave, Mr McElroy Forgive me, came this from... is McElroy. He would be the estimable inspector's favoured suspect. And an Irishman? From Belfast. Is that not significant? Mm, the postmark of the package. It does lend probability to your suspicion, Miss Strain. Well, that is to say, I, I believe Mr McElroy's family were from Belfast... But I'm not certain. It, it might have been Dublin or, or Galway. Well, Australia, that narrows the field to Ireland, anyway. <coughs> Please go on, Miss Cushing. Mr McElroy claimed one evening after dinner to have discovered a human finger in his stew. A singularly inappropriate practical joke. Did he produce it? I refused him the pleasure of showing me. That was well done, Miss Cushing. It was not this incident, though, which caused you to ask the three young gentlemen to leave your house a short time later. It was merely a part of their general behaviour, Inspector. Their noise and their irregular habits. Quite the norm for medical men, wouldn't you say, Watson? No. So you can see, Mr Holmes, we may suppose these men to have owed Miss Cushing a grudge. And to have hoped to frighten her by dispatching some gruesome relics from the dissecting rooms. So we have to believe in so strong a grudge that these men could wait two years before revenging themselves, and in this singularly revolting manner. The police are of that opinion, sir. But you, Miss Cushing, what do you think? I am convinced this matter is a mistake. No, Miss Cushing, we have And you've said this to Inspector Lestrade? I have, several times. Why would anyone play me such a trick, Mr Holmes? As far as I know, I, I have not an enemy in the world. Ah. Well? Well, you would, of course, have observed that the ears are not a pair. I've noticed that, yes. In my experience, Holmes, nobody yet had two left ears. Uh, to send two odd ones, though, would be as easy as to send a pair. Given an unlimited supply of ears, isn't it? Well, the dissecting rooms... Straight, would be this business has nothing to do with any medical student's practical joke. How can we be sure of that? Well, let us say the presumption is strongly against... Oh, presumption. Now, do you spell preservative fluid here, Watson? Mm. You're thinking of carbolic? Or rectified spirits. <laughs> no. I can detect no scent of either. And yet, in spite of the hot weather, there's no decay, evident. Well, the coarse salt here would account for the relative preservation of these very singular enclosures. That and the fact that they were dispatched fresh. Preserved like salt pork. Yeah, it's very perceptive, Watson. Mind you, a freshly arrived corpse in a teaching hospital wouldn't be full of carbolic, would it? Not if our man got to it quickly. But any medical student would naturally use a scalpel for such work and do it neatly, whereas these specimens have been hacked off. Yes, with a none-too-sharp knife. Yeah. I should say one of these is a woman's, and the other a man's. Yes. Both, however, pierced for earrings, and the, the man's ear is sunburned and discoloured. Yes. Does that not suggest anything to you, Inspector? I can't say it does, but then, Mr Holmes, I don't believe it matters much. I have a name for my suspect. Ah, yes, yes, Mr McElroy. Yes. And a motive for a practical joke against Miss Cushing? We have evidence, astray that two people have quite certainly been mutilated in strong suspicion that they may be dead. I think that is fairly clear, yes. But if it's a criminal matter, why should anybody send this most quiet and respectable lady such proofs of his guilt? Well, unless she's the most consummate actress I've ever seen, she knows as little of it as we do. But for this student McElroy, Miss Cushing has no connection with Belfast? Ah, uh, yes, Belfast, from whence this unpleasant package... Yes, I'd like to examine it a little more light, if I may. I was just thinking. Yes, what, Doctor? I remember I once read in a book of Irish legend there was an ancient warrior tribe in Ulster. The Ali. Uh, uh, that was the name, yeah. In battle, they took the ears off their fallen victims for trophies. Did they? And would there be any McElroys descended from this tribe, do you think? <sighs> Lestrade, you have a veritable E-Day fix about Irish medical students. Well, the package was sent from Ireland, wasn't it? But even it militates against your theory. I don't see that. And the address, for instance? Miss S. Cushing, Cross Street, Croydon. Done with a broad, pointed pen and a very inferior ink. What of it? <sighs> the word Croydon has originally been spelt with an I and then corrected. A slip? <laughs> Perhaps. Then, what have you made of the string which tied the package? Hmm? It's string. It smell, smell. It's tarred string. Precisely. It's a piece of twine which has been tarred. And? Cut by Miss Cushing with a scissors. Uh, around the knot. Now, this is of importance. 
As you say, Mr. Holmes. The knot has been left intact, and it's of a particular character. It's very neatly tied. I've already made a note of that. Good. So much for the string, then. Now, uh, the box itself. Yellow, cardboard, half-pound honeydew tobacco, uh, two thumbprints, without a doubt, Miss Cushing's. And the blouse to illustrate, you're right, little of interest. Well, I can't say it concerns me, Mr Holmes. I already have my suspect. And if, as you seem to believe, two people have been murdered... Have you said that, Holmes? Well, if they haven't, according to your theory, we should have heard their story by now. I mean, two people with an ear missing. But who, if not their presumed murderer, would have sent this package to Miss Cushing? Oh, the sender is certainly the man we want. Well, whoever he is, McElroy or some other, he must have strong reason for sending these to this lady. To tell her the deed was done, or it may be to cause pain. Perhaps both. Well, if that's so, then she must know who it is. Then why call in the police? She cannot shield the man by so doing. Yeah, you're right, Watson. If she wished to do that, she would have buried the box with its grisly contents and nobody would have been any the wiser. And if she knows him but doesn't wish to shield him, why not give us his name? The only possible reason is, as she says, that she does not know it. Yes, there's an infernal tangle at the heart of this business. And one more thing, Mr Holmes. Where are the presumed bodies? I have to ask Miss Cushing a few more questions. Mm. Well, I don't think I can learn anything further here. I have some little business in a dissecting room to sort out. A good day to you, gentlemen. Tongues, Watson. Mm. What? The battle trophies of the Ali warriors. They were tongues, not ears. I'm glad Mr Lestrade has no more questions. He would hardly listen to my answers. Uh, tell me about your brother-in-law, Miss Cushing. Who has told you of him? No one. I introduced him. You have two sisters, do you not? But how could you know that, Mr Holmes? The uh, portrait group. On your mantelpiece. Ah. <laughs> My friend Holmes is very quick to make the most extraordinary deductions from a framed portrait. Nothing spectacular this time, Watson. One of the three ladies in this group is undoubtedly yourself, Miss Cushing, while the others are so exceedingly like you. Yes, they are my sisters, Sarah and Mary. Yes, and at my elbow here, another portrait. Your younger sister again. Taken at Liverpool, I see. She was unmarried at the time of this picture, but she's in the company of a young man, a steward by his uniform. The fact that he's still here suggests he subsequently became your brother-in-law. You are very quick at observing, Mr Holmes. It is my trade. Mary was married to Jim Browner a few days after that was taken. He was so fond of her. He was then on the South American line, but he couldn't abide to leave his new wife for so long at a time. So he got into the Liverpool and London boats. That's the Conqueror, perhaps, or the Mayday. The Mayday, when last I heard. So do they live still in Liverpool? We don't know how things are going with them now. There was a quarrel. You don't know my sister Sarah's temper, sir. She and I tried keeping house together when first I moved here to Croydon. But you had to part. About two months ago, she moved to Wallington. Not far, then. But distant enough, Mr Holmes. I wouldn't say a word against my own sister. But she couldn't get on with Mary and Jim Browner, though they lived once altogether the best of friends. At their home? In Liverpool, yes. Sarah went to stay not long after the marriage, but she fell out with Jim last autumn, I believe, and now she has no word too hard for him. You have no knowledge of the cause? No, but Sarah was always meddlesome and hard to please, and try as I might... In the end, she couldn't get on with me either. Is life a boon? If so, it must be fool. The death when you call must go too soon. Dr. McElroy, I presume. <coughs> no, not doctor yet. Fourth year. <coughs> Internal organs. This term? My name is Lestrade. From Scotland Yard, in all the papers, one of our smartest detective officers. Uh, don't let me interrupt your work, Mr McElroy. <clears throat> no, no, I'm quite at your disposal now, Inspector. <coughs> now I've taken what I need. Well, if you keep up with the newspapers, Mr McElroy, you perhaps know already what I wish to ask. <laughs> Not a bit of it, Mr Lestrade. 
I have to re-sit an examination, you see, in three days' time. Do you think I can afford even a minute to read the daily something or other? Then may I start with your activities since Tuesday? I suppose you'll say you've been boning up on anatomy or some such. <laughs> God, no. Tuesday, um... Tuesday I was drunk. You were what? Flat on my back. Most of the afternoon and well into Wednesday morning. Then I... Then I remembered how little I knew for the examination, so I've been here off and on ever since. Off and on? Yeah, man. Has to take a moment away from work from time to time. That's basic anatomy, you know. <laughs> I could, uh, I could get a few good marks for that. <laughs> Can anyone vouch for this? Uh, most of the men here, I should say. Is that not right? Oh, yes. Now, answer me this, McElroy. Have you been home to Belfast this last week? What? Miss Susan Cushing, your former landlady, received on Thursday by parcel post from Belfast a cardboard box containing two severed human ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Mr. Um, what did you say your name was? Lestrade. <laughs> oh, dear heaven. If that isn't the best I've heard this whole month. <laughs> did she think I might have done it? Did she not ask you to leave her house? Because of your notorious delinquency. <laughs> it really is too good, Inspector. No. <coughs> dear, oh, dear, let, let, let us be serious for a moment, then. Uh, I have nothing whatever to do with this, <laughs> this, this package. I'm sorry. So you say. Dear, let me tell you several good reasons why. First, I play no tricks on ladies. Nurses, that's another affair. <laughs> but ladies, no. Second, I have never had reason to go to Belfast. Nor anywhere in Ireland, for that matter. My family came from there, yes, but they have lived in Buckingham these three generations. You, um, you might have had your package sent <laughs> off. <laughs> Man alive! It is two whole years since Miss Cushing and I parted company forever. And any man here will tell you, Inspector, I would not bear a grudge for ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, where in the name of goodness would I be getting the ears from? Well, I should have considered it obvious, man. Just look about you. No, Inspector, you look about you. Look here, for instance. <laughs> Disgraceful. <laughs> You'll find all their heads upstairs, Inspector. In the second year cranial class. Do we expect Miss Sarah Cushing to be at home? If my suspicion is correct, Watson, she either will or will not be. Each eventuality will be of the greatest significance. Oh, this whole business is becoming a miasma. On the contrary. Now, apply yourself to the door knocker. That's a good fellow. Very well. Oh, oh. Good morning to you. Sir, is uh, Miss Cushing not at home, do you know, sir? Miss Sarah Cushing is extremely ill. I'm sorry to hear that. Dr. Shaughnessy. May I ask, Doctor, what is the matter with her? Is it any concern of yours, gentlemen? My friend is himself in practice. John Watson. You'll not be a local man, then. We've just come from Croydon, from Miss Cushing's sister's house. Miss Susan Cushing. Well, I'm afraid you may tell Miss Susan Cushing that Miss Sarah is suffering from brain symptoms of great severity. Do you have any suspicion, Doctor, as to how this may have been brought on? You are probably as well placed as I to guess at that, Doctor. The symptoms began at some time yesterday afternoon and aggravated thereafter. Might it be possible for me to see your patient? I cannot, in conscience, permit it. As Miss Cushing's own medical advisor, I would not wish the responsibility of allowing anyone to disturb her. I should recommend you call again in about ten days. Good day to you, Doctor. Sir? Oh, well, if we can't see her, we can't. That the lady is dangerously ill does not concern you, Holmes. On the contrary. It's conclusive. Oh, that there is now yet another Irish medical man in case. Oh, Watson, you don't seriously entertain what Lestrade's pleased to call a theory, do you? No, 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 no. Of course not. Oh, good. Hmm. Well, I have a telegram to send. And then, my dear fellow, you may congratulate me, for the matter is entirely cleared up. <laughs> I can still hear that gallows bird laughing. Lestrade? Thank you. <clears throat> to think that your profession, Dr Watson, can harbour such... Mm. 
Little better than hooligans. You allowed your natural antipathy for Mr. McElroy to get the better of your open mind. I tried to help you, Lestrade. I thrust each indication to the contrary under your nose, literally, but you failed to draw the appropriate conclusion. So that was why we kept sniffing at everything to do with that infernal cardboard box. Precisely the string, Lestrade. Do you remember the string? It was tar. Hmm. Of a quality and type used by sailmakers aboard ship. Well, I grant a medical student might have possessed some, but taken into account with the rest, with a knot which tied the package. Of a particular character, you said? Hmm. Favoured by sailors. The package was posted from... Belfast and... An important Ma seaport, the preservation of the ears, as you, Watson, so pertinently observed, like salt pork. Mm. A sailor would think first of that, not a medical student, and then the male ear was pierced for an earring. Oh, it's very clear now, of course. Well, the key to McElroy's innocence lay not in these counter-indications, which all pointed to the sea. See? No? Then what? You should have seen it, Lestrade. You really should. The misspelling of the word Croydon. I instead of Y. Hmm. By a medical student living in South London for two years and more. <laughs> Not to be credited. At the time, though, Holmes, suspicion of McElroy did appear to have merit. But I approached the case with what was essential. An open mind. And had you been right in McElroy, Lestrade, with what could you have charged him? Breach of the Queen's peace? Hmm? Abuse of the Royal Mail? Yeah, well... Desecration of a corpse? A hard task to charge that to a medical student. No, my dear Inspector. Better you should earn the credit for solving an extremely shocking and serious crime. But do you mean you've found out everything, Mr Holmes? Yes, every detail. An answer to my telegram earlier this afternoon has provided me with the only missing piece to the puzzle. Then who is the criminal? That is the name, Inspector. Good God. He's killed twice, Lestrade. Take care. Are you expecting a fight? Get a lot of them, Montgomery, do you? Oh, they come and go with the tide, like the ships that bring them in. One of my specials lost an eye last week, somewhere in a scrum of Malays or Chinaman, I don't know. The Liverpool and London ships are generally quiet enough. Well, let's hope the May Day runs true to form, then. Mm. Straight. Isn't that your man? Could be. Yes. He's going to walk right into us. There's luck. What do you want? Jim Brown, eh? Yes. Do you want my papers? Mind the bag, Lestrade! Hey, what are you doing, man? You're coming with me, Brown, out. Help! Leave! Oh. oh, no, you don't! <laughs> <laughs> Shut the door, sir. Oh, God. Who's got the derby? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm arresting you, James Browner, on two charges of murder. Do you have anything to say? My God, Lestrade. Like a baby. Oh, Mr. Holmes, come in. And Dr. Watson, good morning. Good morning. My apologies for so early an invitation, but I knew you'd like to see the result of the scheme we had formed to test our theories. How do you do, Mr. Brown? You didn't need to come for me, sir. He intends, he says, to make a clean breast of it all. Though I don't doubt but that you'll find it an extremely simple affair. But to a keen student of human experience, it cannot fail to be interesting. And to an author, Watson, yes? Well, I'm not sure that the public taste will accept of the details, you know. I don't care a plug what you do with my story or me. You can't punish me as I've been punished already. I've not shut an eye in sleep since. Sometimes it's his face, but more generally it's hers. Kind of surprised. He cared all right when we took him. I have the marks to prove it. But then he says he didn't know we were the police. I've been jumped once or twice before in port at night. And right enough he came docile once we had the derbies on him. Mind you, they usually do. Tell us about the three sisters, Mr Browner. It was Sarah's doing. Oh, come now. I don't say it to clear myself. I know the man I was. But the root of the business is Sarah Cushing loved me. Shilling, two and sixpence. And two odd pennies for the pig. In all Liverpool, there was no better woman than my Mary. How shall we spend it all? 
Whatever you say, my love, is what we'll do. Then I shall take it to the Friendly Society for a rainy day. <laughs> and you could have had whatever your fancy was, Mary. Oh, I have only the one fancy. My Jim. My love. I had taken the pledge at that time. And I wore the teetotaler's blue ribbon with the pride of a man truly reformed, I can tell you. Mary kept our lives bright as a new dollar. Shall you be home again this weekend? Better. Really? The May Day's being held back for cargo. For how long? Well... Oh, come on, Jim, how long? It might be a week. Could you put up with me for a whole week? Oh, could I not? <laughs> My God. Whoever would have thought it could have come to this. Since you'll have the week, then... Anything you wish. Might you find time to put up the old bedstead in the other room? Why? Who's coming to stay? Well, we haven't seen my sister since the wedding, Jim. And which of your many sisters would you be talking about? <laughs> Don't be silly. When you're an only child, Mary, three seems a big, big family. <laughs> but use your head, Jim Browner, for once. Susan has all her waking hours used up keeping that lodging house of hers. Mm, she's a good woman. God forbid you should have to slave like she does. And who should it be to stay with us but Sarah? And now we can afford it. Can we? I'll show you. Here are our outgoings, see? Yes, the older sister was just a good woman. The youngest, my Mary, she was an angel. And the second was a devil. <sighs> so much better here, Jim, than in stuffy, smoky old London. <laughs> she was a fine, tall woman, black hair, quick and fierce and flint sparks in her eyes. I could be at home here, old Jim with the ships and the men that sail in them. But as I hope for God's mercy, gentlemen, when my little wife Mary was with me, I had never a thought for Miss Sarah Cushing, and that I swear. Shall we take a turn a little further, then? Why not? I've half an hour or so before Mary gets back from her shopping. Oh, it's good to have your company. When one knows so few people in Liverpool as I do, if you and Mary are both out of the place, I'm sure I become as cantankerous as any old maid. Oh, you're not old, Sarah. Not you. <laughs> Thank you, kind sir. Four years my Mary's seen you. That's nothing. Mary is a child still, to her sisters at least. It had seemed to me on occasion that she would make times and places where she could be alone with me. But I thought nothing of it for some weeks. I've made your coffee. Where's Mary, then? She's just out to pay some accounts. <laughs> Sit down, Jim. I've got your meal nearly ready, too. Uh, I'd rather wait, Sarah. Aren't you hungry? I am, yes. Then come on. No, oh, it's just I'd rather we ate as a family. Oh, Jim. Can't you be happy for just five minutes without Mary? She's my wife. But it's a poor compliment to me, isn't it? For so short a time, you can't be content with my company. And then I knew. Is that not so? That's all right, my lass. There. I had just put out my hand to her in a kindly way, no more. And her clasp burned as if with a fever. We didn't speak. What was it to say? I saw it all in her eyes. So, I took my hand back again from hers. <laughs> Steady, old Jim. <laughs> she hated me from the moment of that rejection. Heaven has no rays like love to hatred turned. And you may think me a fool for it, but I let her go on biding with us, for Mary's sake. Did Sarah Cushing show you any overt malice? She avoided me, but she and Mary... We're never apart. Husband and wife do grow away from each other, Mary, you know. After a time. And I found myself left aside from them more and more. But so soon. Oh, I suppose it's in their nature. And then Jim's away so much. Don't you worry for him? Less now I have your company, Sarah. And when he's back home... Oh, yes. Well, he has the both of us to talk to. And when I have to go out... Yes. Is that something wrong? Not really. Sarah? I... Mary. I'd rather not find myself alone with him again. What do you mean? My God. How that woman could hate. 
even to poison my own wife's mind against me. So you say, Browner, but that's never been reckoned an excuse for murder. I don't excuse myself. Aren't I being punished for it? Maybe you are. You certainly will be. Well, as I tell you, I don't care. And don't care was hung. For a sheep as for a lamb. So I broke my blue ribbon. Started drinking hard again. Poisoned my mind as Sarah was doing for Mary. All against myself, you see. And she, who had always been so blithe and trusting, became now irritable, suspicious. Is that surprising enough? When you talk to drink and violence? Not against her. Man, you killed her. <laughs> I never looked on her with anything but love before. Who was the man? Sarah brought him into my house. He was a dashing, swaggering chap, Fair Ben. Smart and curled. Good company, I won't deny it. Wonderful, polite ways. And he could talk. Oh, he could talk about what he'd seen. And he'd seen half the world. Our door became always open to him, for he was a friend to us all. It was a month or more. I never suspected a thing. But it takes only a little mischance, and then all a man's peace is gone forever. How glad I am to see you. Why, Jim? Who did you think I was? Why are you home so soon? Why are you so disappointed to see me? What have you been doing? Did you think I was him? No, who? Fair Ben. Did you hope I was fair, Ben? Whatever gave you that idea? Jim! But I knew. There was no other step she could have mistaken for mine. Jim, have you been drinking? If I could have seen him then, I should have killed him. Don't look at me like that, Jim. Don't! What kind of company have you been keeping? What kind of company are you now to me? Where's Sarah? What has she got to do with this? Don't you question me! Jim, don't! Where is she? She's in the parlour! He'd been in and out of my house with his soft, tricky ways. And that devil sister of hers who thought she could turn me against my wife by encouraging them. What is it with you, Jim? Alec Fairburn. Alec? Why are you angry with Alec? Oh, Sarah. This man, Fairburn, I never want to find him here again in my house. But he's good company, Jim. And especially when you're not at home, Mary and I need someone yes, to talk to. Yes, you're like that, aren't you? What? I tell you, he is not to come here again. But why ever not, Jim? Because I order it. Well, I can see if my friends are not good enough for this house, then neither am I. You can do what you like about it. Your wife's own sister. It gives you no right to put your fancy friends between a man and his wife. And you listen to me well, Sarah Cushing. If that Alec Fairbairn shows his face here again, I'll send you one of his ears as a keepsake. And so you did. Only it was Miss Susan, not Miss Sarah Cushing, who received the package. Because you didn't know those two sisters had fallen out as well. That Miss Sarah had left Croydon two months ago. I never meant to hurt any but Sarah. I swear it. For so well-meaning a man, you seem to have a remarkable facility for harm. I was not my own master. Sarah left Liverpool. Mary began first to fear me, then to hate me. And as I was driven more to the drink, I could see she despised me as well. Then came this week. Misery and ruin. Monday, I sailed in the May Day on the afternoon tide. Seven days we were to have been away, but we sprang a plate. Had to put back into Liverpool. What a surprise for Mary, I thought. And it was. She was with him, with Fairbairn, on a day out to New Brighton. The drink and the jealousy had fairly turned my brain. They took a boat out, I followed. I don't ever want to have to go back. 
It was just as if they'd been given into my hands. Oh, good. I was beginning to think you were getting bored with my company. <laughs> oh, steady. The calm sea haze was like a curtain all around us. Somebody's there. Another boat. Hello there. It's like a dream now. But that afternoon, I seemed to have all Niagara in my head. Slow up! There's a boat ahead of you! My God, shall I ever forget their faces. You'll have us over! No! You mad fool! You should be long away! Damn your black soul to hell! Yeah. Oh. Oh. He came at me with an oar. He must have seen death in my eyes. Not here! You'll kill us all! Let her go! Let her... No! I would have spared her for all my madness. Alec, my love, my love. She went to him. Oh, you murdering, bloody god! If Sarah had been there, by the Lord, she should have joined them. But as it was, it gave me a kind of savage joy to think how she would feel when she saw the signs of her meddling's result. Then I tied the bodies into the boat and stove in a plank. Rejoined your ship and posted the proof of your crime from your first port of call. And that's the whole truth of it. Now do what you will with me. You can't punish me any more than I am. A sordid affair, gentlemen. Will you recover the bodies? The Cheshire Constabulary can try. Food for fishes only fitted by my guess. Browner's statement will be enough. Mind you, without his fit of remorse, we should have had precious little evidence. But the ears, Lestrade. Well, it could have been anyone's without a matching body. I think not. No, indeed. There is no part of the body which varies so much as the human ear. And the female ear in that cardboard box was an exact match for Miss Susan Cushing's. The victim was clearly a blood relation. A very close one. We had already a whiff of the sea, you'll remember, from the evidence of the package. And now we discovered that there were two other Cushing sisters, one of whom had the same initial as Miss Susan and had recently lived with her in Croydon. And the younger sister, Mary, was married to a steward on the London and Liverpool shipping line. I think the connections are now obvious. Hmm, obvious perhaps in retrospect. But you had no proof of the second body's identity. Suppose Mr and Mrs Browner had both been murdered. By an unsuccessful lover, say. It was a clear possibility, and easily solved by the dispatch of a telegram to the Liverpool police. I inquired if Mrs Browner were at home and if her husband had departed on the May Day. As soon as I had the reply, I was able to give you, Lestrade, the name of the murderer. Ah, oh, you make it appear so prosaic, Holmes. So much of everyday police work is just that, Doctor. Ah, oh, sir, I'm sorry, Watson. I cannot always supply your avid readers with the most spectacular feats of detection. You may obfuscate the telegram if you find it too every day. Say I deduced the entire business by mere force of close reason. I shall tell the truth, Holmes, as always. In The Cardboard Box, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr Watson by Michael Williams. With Kevin Waitley as Jim Browner, and Stephen Thorne as Inspector Lestrade. Mary Browner was played by Teresa Gallagher, Alex Fairbairn by James Telfer, Sarah Cushing by Rachel Atkins, Susan Cushing by Diana Payan, McElroy by Dominic Letts, Inspector Montgomery by John Evitz, and Annabelle by Una Beeson. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Cardboard Box was dramatised for radio by Roger Danes, and directed by Patrick Rayner. <laughs>